Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Olivia Daigle, and I'm the Public Programming Coordinator for the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. Our mission at the Council is to convene and connect people around global issues to build a thriving, competitive, and inclusive Pittsburgh. And our vision is for a globally minded and globally connected world that is equitable and just for all. We're so excited to be partnering with the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater on this program series. Art plays such an important role in our culture and we look forward to hearing today's panelists thoughts around this role, particularly during times of global turmoil. Before getting into today's program, we want to acknowledge for all joining us from around the region and the world that we are located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples, including the Seneca, Lenape, Osage, and Shawnee. Through this acknowledgement, we invite you to join us in paying respect to the elders, both past and present. I'd now like to turn it back over to Lisa to introduce today's program. Hi everybody, I'm Lisa All, and I'm in the education department at Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. And this is the first of a two-part series called Swan Lake's Global Moment, co-presented by Pittsburgh Ballet Theater and World Affairs Council Pittsburgh. In our two programs, we are going to explore this beloved and iconic ballet, Swan Lake, as a cultural touch point in the context of Russia's current war on Ukraine, as well as the role of artistic performance in cultural exchange and global conflict. The series is part of our educational programming around PBT's upcoming production of Swan Lake, May 6th through 15th want to acknowledge to Kara Bowen, World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh, and Lindsay Kane of PBT, who are on the program as well, helping with uh, helping in the background. And a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we would love to take your questions in the Q&A feature or on Facebook. Um, and please let us know if you have any technical difficulties as well. And one more thing, um, please understand that there is no un unauthorized recording of this program. Our program today, Reconsidering Swan Lake Culture and Context, discusses the cultural meaning of Swan Lake in Russian politics and ideological history. Next Wednesday, our panel discussion looks broadly at the arts as cultural export in the context of the current war with a focus on the experience of marginalized groups and artists during global conflict. So we hope you'll be able to join us for that program as well. And now it's my honor to introduce our presenters today. Dr. Natalie Rulin serves as scholar in residence at the Washington Ballet and global fellow at the Kennan Institute in Washington, DC. She has taught Russian literature, language, and film courses at Wellesley College, Miami University, Stanford University. She has held the Billington Fellowship at the Woodrow Wilson Center the Fellowship for the Study of Russia and Ballet at New York University's Center for Ballet and the Arts, the Klug Fellowship at the Library of Congress, the Fulbright Hayes Fellowship in St. Petersburg, and the Gabali Fellowship at the Stanford Humanities Center, and the Fulbright Fellowship in Moscow. Her first book, Power on Point, Unmasking Russia's Ballet Empire, is currently under review with Princeton University Press. Natalie is a committed advocate of arts education and has spoken at the Kennedy Center, the Russian Cultural Center, the World Affairs Council, the Wilson Center, the Library of Congress, and numerous universities. In recognition of her work with the Washington Ballet, Rulin was featured in Dance Magazine in 2020. And last year, she co-hosted a digital series called Bar Talk with Washington Ballet Artistic Director Julie Kent. Willen has advised on the Washington Ballet's productions of The Sleeping Beauty, Swan Lake, and Giselle. And she holds a BA from Wellesley College and a PhD from Stanford. Welcome, Dr. Willen, and welcome to Pittsburgh virtually. And thank you so much for being here. Our other speaker, Professor Nancy Condi, is director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, the Title VI National Resource Center at the University of Pittsburgh with academic affiliations in the Slavic department and the program for film and media studies. Her publications include Imperial Trace, Recent Russian Cinema, published by Oxford University Press, which was awarded the MLA Scaglioni Prize and the Kovacs Book Award 
from the Society for Cinema and Media Studies. Her articles have appeared in The Nation, The Washington Post, October, New Left Review, PMLA, Sight and Sound, as well as numerous Russian journals. She's worked as a consultant for the Carnegie Corporation, the Edinburgh Film Festival, San Francisco Film Festival, the Library of Congress, and PBS on several frontline documentaries. Her research interests are Russian cultural politics with a specialization in contemporary cinema. Thank you, Dr. Condi, for being with us across town and for sharing your expertise with us today. So in this program, we look at Swan Lake, a ballet that is almost synonymous with the art form. And what we want to explore is its cultural meaning and the context of its creation within the Russian imperialist agenda of the 19th century. We want to begin the process of understanding how and why it has come to have this weighty cultural meaning within Russian society beyond its status as one of the most important ballets of the 19th century. We'll begin with Dr. Rulin and we'll set, who will set the historical and sociopolitical context of the ballet. And then Dr. Condi will join the conversation and draw a line through to the present and consider its place at the intersection of politics and culture today. Dr. Rulin. Thank you, Lisa, for your introduction. Thank you to the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater, as well as the Washington, uh, the uh, World Affairs Council for hosting this very timely discussion of Swan Lake. So I will be talking this afternoon about um, the history of Russian ballet in particular. Um, let me see, did my screen share properly? Let me share this. Perfect. I'll be talking this afternoon about the historical origins and the ideological arc of Swan Lake in Russian culture, as recent images of the ballet have resurrected the Soviet encoding of Swan Lake as a symbol of social protest. It's important to understand what Swan Lake meant in its time and place. The golden era of Russian ballet as we know it today began with a late and great 19th century collaboration of Russian composer Pyotr Tchaikovsky, French choreographer Marius Petipa, and Russian choreographer Lev Ivanov. The imperial audiences of St. Petersburg and Moscow witnesses, witnessed ballets such as The Sleeping Beauty, The Nutcracker, and Swan Lake that remain artistic benchmarks of companies around the world and box office gold to this day. Yet Swan Lake was part of a concerted project of empire building that stretched back to the first Romanov czars and reached its pinnacle in the second half of the 19th century. As ballet waned in the more democratic nation states of Europe, the imperial ballet flourished in autocratic Russia. These ballets were commissioned and overseen by the imperial theater directorate and funded by the czar's household budget. As such, they were a direct reflection of the aesthetic tastes and political agendas of the reigning czar and Russia's ruling elite. From its origins, ballet served both as cultural appropriation, as Russia emulated European models of empire, and as cultural colonization, as Russia showcased its prowess in the international arena. Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich performed alongside a troupe of German actors in Russia's first ballet in 1673, and Peter the Great integrated the dance of Louis XIV into the Russian court as a civilizing and Europeanizing agent. Yet it was not until Empresses Anna and Catherine establishes theater schools in St. Petersburg and Moscow in the 18th century that Russia began to develop ballet as a distinctly Russian institution. These schools were populated by the children of household serfs, and indeed many members of the landed gentry operated their own serf theaters in emulation of the imperial system. Thus, from its institutional beginnings, the ballet represented a power dynamic in which the artists of Imperial Russia served at the pleasure of a ruling elite in a form of conscription maintained and monitored by the state. The emancipation of the serfs in 1861 alienated many of those landowners who formerly supported Tsar Alexander II. 
This social schism combined with Russia's diminished military confidence made ballet paramount as a symbol for strengthening the image of the monarchy and for projecting power at home and abroad. Of relevance for its 20th and 21st century connotation with the death of a leader, Swan Lake was from the start a ballet of mourning and memorialization. The original 1877 production with musical score by Tchaikovsky and choreography by Czech ballet master Julius Reisinger was set around a lake of tears shed by the Swan Queen Odette's grandfather for the untimely death of her mother. Odette is haunted by a stepmother who wishes to destroy her in the 1877 production and is enslaved by an evil spirit who desires to keep her in the form of a swan for eternity in the 1895 production and the shores of the lake serve as her respite. While many details of the libretto and staging have changed in the 145 years since the ballet premiered on March 4th, 1877 at the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow, the lake of memory remains an iconic image of ballet history and the transformative power of art. The Swan Lake that we recognize today dates back to the 1895 production in St. Petersburg with choreography by Marius Petipa and Lev Ivanov. The ballet itself memorialized Tchaikovsky, who expressed enthusiasm in restaging the ballet with Petipa prior to the composer's death in 1893. Tchaikovsky's brother Modeste worked with the Imperial Theater Directorate to revise the score and libretto, and this revival premiered on January 27, 1895 at the Marinsky Theater in St. Petersburg. The canonic Patipa Ivanov production of Swan Lake depicted the ill-fated love of Prince Siegfried and the Swan Queen Odette. Set in medieval Germany, the ballet transpired against the backdrop of an enchanted lake and the machinations of the demonic von Rothbart, who held the swans by day, maidens by night, under a spell. The first act represented the bon vivant milieu of the hunter hero, Prince Siegfried, and highlighted his preference for the pleasurable pursuits of youth over the feudal obligations of a noble marriage. The second scene of act one portrayed the magical world of the swans and their queen to whom the prince swears his true love in order to save Odette from her fate. The second act revealed the courtly realm of the ball during which Siegfried breaks his vow to Odette by agreeing to wed von Rothbart's glamorous daughter Odile in the guise of Odette. The third act returned to the community of swan maidens along the shores of the lake, underscored the irrevocability of Siegfried and Odette's love, and dramatized the fatal consequences of the prince's infidelity, the watery demise of the doomed lovers made immortal. While the choreography of Swan Lake changed greatly between 1877 and 1895, the haunting music of Tchaikovsky remained central to the ballet. Swan Lake was Tchaikovsky's first ballet commission and was clearly ahead of its time as contemporary critics found it too complex and symphonic for a ballet. The emotional lyricism, psychological saturation, and romantic melodics echoed the works of the 1820s and 1830s by Vincenzo Bellini, Franz Schubert, and Mikhail Glinka. At the time of its composition, Tchaikovsky spent time studying ballet scores in the theater library and was especially impressed by the score for Sylvia by Leo Delib. Tchaikovsky's score also contains passages from his abandoned opera of 1869, Undine. The duet, Andante non troppo, Undine, Forget My Tr Transgression, was used for the pas de deux of Siegfried and Odette and Swan Lake, with the vocal parts replaced by solo, cello, and violin. Indeed, Tchaikovsky's Odette owes much in conception and form to Undine. The original Odette of 1877 is primarily a water sprite and secondarily a swan, in contrast to the later Enchanted Swan Maiden of 1895. Social dance also played a prominent role in Tchaikovsky's composition in this period. As ballet historian Alexander Demidov has established in his work on Swan Lake, quote, the dance rhythms and melodies were suggested by the cultural atmosphere of Moscow's social life. Waltzes and polonaises were indispensable attributes of the endless balls and masquerades Tchaikovsky often attended during his Moscow period. Here we see a polonaise performed at the Winter Palace in 1874 on the occasion of the marriage of Maria Alexandrovna to the Duke of Edinburgh, 
which recalls the opening goblet dance of Swan Lake Act I. Also on the right, we see a photo of Nicholas II and Empress Alexandra at a 1903 masquerade celebrating the 300-year jubilee of the Romanov dynasty, in which aristocratic revelers channeled 17th century rulers. This celebration was also notable for the performance of Swan Lake starring Anna Pavlova just two years prior to her eulogistic Dying Swan by ballet russe choreographer Michel Fokine. The central European setting of Swan Lake reflected the geopolitical shifts of Europe at a crossroads, with the contentious reconfiguration of empires and emergence of nation states. This area was especially significant for the Russian Empire in light of the Polish uprising of 1863 and the establishment of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1867. In addition to the stately Polish Polonaise featured in Act I, Swan Lake represented nationality through character dance. Character dance at this time presented national identity in a larger framework, and the Hungarian Chardas, as well as the Polish Mazurka, were displayed alongside Spanish and Italian style dances in the Act II ball scene. Here, dance performance reflected, articulated, and projected the emerging national identities on stage, and they remain with us today as we see in this production from Mar the Marinsky. Yet the procession of character dances at the ball itself a form of masquerade in which von Rothbart and Odile deceive the prince, suggests a more complex portrayal than earlier romantic ballets, such as Giselle, in which folk dance organically developed the plot. In Swan Lake, character dances become decorative divertissement, removed from the plot and devoid of authenticity. Just as in Orientalist ballets, such as La Bayadere and The Pharaoh's Daughter, in which fixed figures of choreography, character, and plot are transposed to different, quote, exotic settings to suit the purpose of a new ballet, Swan Lake renders national identities as interchangeable set pieces and highlights Russia's imperialist aspirations in Central Europe. Over the course of the 20th century, color coding increasingly dominated Swan Lake as Odette and Odile gained popular currency as the white and black swans, respectively. Originally, the white acts of Swan Lake revived the ballet blanc that was characteristic of European romanticism. Ballets such as Robert Le Diable, La Sylphide, and Giselle popularized the white tulle costumes that adorned homogeneous troops of core dancers, from cavorting nuns to sylphs to willies. In the 1877 production, Tchaikovsky's swans evoked the ethereal quality of magical maidens that elicited both fear and fascination in the romantic imagination. With the simplification of the plot in 1895, however, the swans morphed from supernatural creatures with their own agency into victimized women under the spell of an omnipotent male. The innovation of Odette and Odile being performed by the same dancer additionally required a costume differentiation easily recognizable by the audience. Thus, we see here the polarization of the feminine encoded in the very choreographic expression of the pure and faithful white swan, Odette, and her foil, the sexually provocative and deceptive black swan, Odile. As Russian historian Richard Wartman has suggested, the absolute sovereignty of Russian monarchy was predicated on the establishment of the Romanov dynasty as European. This power structure, consisting of a Europeanized elite ruling over a multi-ethnic, multi-faith empire, was reinforced ballets that celebrated a singularly European and Christian ideal. This Eurocentric vision is particularly evident in the 1895 production of Swan Lake which conjured memories of the romantic ballet's harem with its mostly white maidens held prisoner by an evil genie. In the 1877 production, the Swan Queen's stepmother in the guise of an owl figured as the primary villain, while the demonic von Rothbart played a minor role. By 1895, however, von Rothbart took center stage and featured the anti-Semitic caricature of horns and a red beard following extensive Jewish pogroms and anti-Jewish policies under Tsar Alexander III. 
In the 1950 production of Swan Lake by Konstantin Sergeyev that is still in the repertoire of the Marinsky to this day, von Rothbart served as the puppet master not only of Odile, but a of a scattering of black swans punctuating the other white white core. As seen in the synopsis here, black swans scattered throughout the flock serve as the disruptive agents of von Rothbart. Quote, the swan maidens stand dejected and sad. Odette has told them what has happened. Siegfried rushes in. He begs Odette to forgive him and he professes his undying love for her. But the enraged sorcerer summons the black swans and commands them to separate Odette and Siegfried. Siegfried grapples with the sor sorcerer. Fearless in the encounter, he breaks von Rothbard's wing. The sorcerer collapses, his power gone, and he dies. Love has broken the evil spell. The sun rises and shines radiantly on the prince and Odette and on the maidens whom Siegfried has rescued. In addition to emphasizing the loaded black and white dichotomy of Odile and Odette, the Sergeyev production elevated the role of Siegfried from Tchaikovsky's anti-hero to an ideologically acceptable Soviet hero. This heroic masculinity was at odds with the wavering prince of 1877, who even caused the death of Odette by removing her talismanic crown and rendering her vulnerable to the stepmother who haunted her. We could even argue that the heroic Soviet and post-Soviet depiction of Siegfried recalls the knight errant of Petipa's 1898 crusades theme ballet, Raimonda. In Sergei Swan Lake's happy ending, our Germanic prince slays the demonic von Rothbart and is united with his white swan in a veritable apotheosis of European culture. What made Swan Lake so famous in the international repertoire was the interpretation of fabled dancers from the original Italian ballerina, Pierina Lignani, who originated the 32 fouetté turns in the ball scene, to Anna Pavlova, who toured Swan Lake with the Imperial Russian Ballet in the first decade of the 20th century and performed the neglected Russian character dance from the ballet with her own company in Britain in 1910. As part of the Ballet Russe cultural export campaign, which Alexander Benoit described as a, quote, barbarian invasion, Sergei Diaghilev's troupe performed versions of Swan Lake in 1911 in London and in 1924 in Monte Carlo. Notably, a century before this balletic invasion, Russian ballets such as the 1814 Russian Victory or the Russians in Paris chronicled the occupation of Napoleonic France. The first female choreographed Swan Lake was Bronislava Nijinska's 1919 production in Kyiv, and the first productions drawing directly from the Stepanov choreographic notation outside of Russia were mounted by Nicholas Sergeyev in the 1940s in Britain. Emigre choreographer George Balanchine choreographed his own two-act version for New York City Ballet in 1951, starring Maria Talchief as Odette and Odile. And the celebrated Soviet defector Rudolf Nureyev re-envisioned Swan Lake for the Vienna Opera in 1964 and 20 years later for Paris. All the while, Swan Lake remained a staple in the Soviet repertoire. A product of late imperial culture, Swan Lake both represented the very empire whose passage it memorialized and also projected Soviet prowess as an instrument of Cold War diplomacy. The prestige of Russian and Soviet ballet, as epitomized by carefully preserved productions of Swan Lake, also generated an entire empire of diasporic and defector dancers, companies, and schools across Europe and the Americas. As a product of 19th century Russian culture, Swan Lake was very much a reflection of its time, place, and politics. Yet the ballet that was constantly revived and revised in its own era acquired the trappings of a museum piece in canonic productions of the 20th century. Contemporary productions of Swan Lake have extended the late imperial legacy of Petipa through the choreographic notation of Vladimir Stepanov compiled by Alexander Gorsky and Nicholas Sergeyev from 1901 to 1907 and acquired by the Harvard Theater Collection in 1967. In addition to Alexei Radmansky's 
recent reconstructions of the ballet in Zurich, Milan, and Miami, companies such as the Washington Ballet have utilized the Swan Lake notation as a touch point or source of originary inspiration while updating their productions for today's audience. As contemporary ballet seeks new ways to keep classical works in the repertoire, the two-part process of education and evaluation, acknowledging imperialist implications and assessing artistic sources will endow artists and audiences enamored of ballet's past with the potential tools to transform its future. And as we see here, the very same dance of Swan Lake's Four Little Swans preserved in the Stepanov notation continues to resonate and generate new meanings in political discourse across the globe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, really um, so incredible to sort of start to peel back the layers, peel back into the layers of Swan Lake into this very um, rich and uh, incredibly beloved ballet and kind of get at the origins of this ballet. Um, and so now uh, let's fast forward to today to see something really fascinating that is happening in this moment um, and the resonance that Swan Lake has today kind of appearing in the national consciousness at this moment of political and social turmoil and change. Um, so just going off of this image here of the Four Little Swans, a very famous um, and loved dance in the ballet, let's kind of talk about what sense we can make of this picture. Let's turn to Dr. Condi to discuss this intersection of politics and arts and culture today. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, so I want to stay for a moment with this picture on the right hand side, because I think it has tremendous resonance uh, within Russia and within the former Soviet Union. And I want to ask the question, what does it mean? It's wall graffiti. It appeared in 2018. It's 2018 over 1991. Who knows what it means? It's an enigmatic graffiti. It's very rich in meaning. It's an example of what a, a certain kind of Aesopian language from Aesop's fables, meaning allegorical speech, something that has a has a different meaning or is referring to two, two things at once. Um, I think it has a richer meaning in part because it is veiled, it's inscrutable. We're not sure exactly initially what it means. By withholding an explicit meaning, it becomes more saturated with meaning. Um, we do know if we try to piece it together that 2018 was Putin's fourth, fourth presidential term. Uh, it, his, his current presidential term will run from 2018 to 2024. We anticipate that he will be in power barring any um, political upheavals until 2036, regardless of how we um, relate to that fact. Um, it's also a piece of wall art, which doesn't therefore make it a protest. But the very fact that it's not explicit the way official wall art, the way governmental wall art is explicit. Governmental wall art tells you what you're meant to be thinking. This does not easily tell you what you're meant to be thinking. Um, and so therefore it's worth imagining that it's a form of protest, which of course it is, but you can recognize that because it's, it's, it's uh, enigmatic. Um, so 2018 is therefore becomes not a celebration of Putin's inauguration, but a protest against it implicitly. And it's a particular kind of protest because it's the kind of protest that the police cannot intervene and say, no, Putin is not the president in 2018. What is there to, to agitate against? It's a, it's a declaration of fact. It's a very clever declaration of fact. It's one that the authorities cannot crack down on. So underneath that 2018 date is 1991. We would see it in the West as the end of the Soviet Union, the date when the Soviet Union ends. Uh, I think an internal citizen would recognize it as the August coup. Um, and what we know from the appearance of Swan Lake historically is that Swan Lake tends to appear because it's, it's supposedly an emblem of universality, 
um, and continuation, that it's actually a sign of crisis when it appears on television. Uh, when unexpectedly Swan Lake appears on uh, TV, you know things are going to hell. It's crisis and therefore it, the image of Swan Lake communicates continuity. Uh, in a time of instability, it communicates stability. In a time of death, it communicates creativity and beauty. So all of this is its own kind of reverse reading that first Soviet and then Russian citizens, post-Soviet citizens became very good at doing this kind of anti-reading or anti-allegory reverse reading. If you see X, the one thing it doesn't mean is X. <laughs> it might mean Y, but it might mean green or whatever, but it does not mean X. So it's that kind of reading that this poster speaks to. And if I could put it in a, in a single word, it would mean um, that Putin is inaugurated in 2018. Please let us see Swan Lake on television as we saw it in 1991. That's the political jab that you're seeing acted out here uh, with the beautiful ballerinas in a delicate dance that kind of covers over the call for overthrow. Now, a slightly different level of meaning for, for the four little ballerinas is uh, refers back to the original broadcast of Swan Lake in eight, 1982 with the death of Brezhnev. Uh, when Swan Lake was first um, broadcast, um, inexplicably, nobody understood why we suddenly got Swan Lake until it turned out that Brezhnev had died and all the, all the offices were swathed in, in black, Everything closed early. Uh, nothing on television was broadcast except Swan Lake. And so Swan Lake became a kind of a placeholder for crisis. It was broadcast again for the death of Andropov and again for um, Chernyanka. Uh, and it became in general a symbol of disruption even though it's meant to, con to communicate the opposite. So what's interesting about this is that Swan Lake becomes its own form of Aesopian language in a culture in which Aesopian language is usually deployed by dissidents, by anti-Soviet or anti-Putin, but can also be deployed by the government itself as a way of saying the opposite of what's in fact going on. The capper for me, as some of you listening to me already know, um, is in the most recent uh, crackdown following February 24th, and the invasion of Ukraine, not the war in Ukraine, but the invasion of Ukraine, um, the independent channel TV Rain, when informed that it was not permitted to say war, it had instead to say military operation. And it realized it really can't broadcast under those terms if it can't pronounce the word war, pronounce the word invasion. It realized quite sensibly that it had to shut down altogether. And when it came time to shut off their TV station, what did they put on the air? Swan Lake, of course, which is both you know, a, a signal of crisis, but also a way of, say, of capturing official um, solemnity and using it against, against the government itself. So this misuse of Swan Lake precisely um, cuts both ways uh, in, in Russian and post-Soviet culture. Now, I know there are those of you out there that would like to see Swan Lake be kept pure, be kept authentic, be kept eternal um, for whatever reasons. I won't argue against that. But I think as Natalie has already showed us, shown us most eloquently, it cannot be pure. It's already not pure. It's subject to history. It's already subject to change with production after production. Moreover, the more impure it is, the more it's captured as a spoof, for example, or as a parody or as a travesty, the sturdier it becomes as a placeholder in culture, the surer its position is through the ages. If you take an example like Mona Lisa, for example, Mona Lisa is eternal in part because it's been spoofed so many times. It goes into circulation, is recirculated and recirculated. And in that circulation, its position becomes sure. It's an homage, whether it intends to be a travesty, it always is an homage. And therefore my own view is that we should welcome it. It's a kind of um, free publicity uh, uh, that makes the, makes the production sturdier. 
Um, I want to say a couple of words about um, something that might have a little bit more discomfort associated with it, but in the sense that discomfort might be a good thing. Um, the audience is not passive. As those of you in the guests, and I look at the list of people that are listening to me, and I see some people that are very serious ball ballet, former ballerinas, ballet scholars, ballet experts, and they know more than anybody that the audience is not passive, that the audience makes sense of and metabolizes its own Swan Lake with every production. And so therefore, if we ask the question, should Russian Imperial Ballet even be staged during the invasion of Ukraine? I want to say without taking an explicit position on that, I'll share a couple of thoughts. Um, who, if not ballet audiences, uh, are, are not best equipped to make their own sense of new productions as active spectators. They have what we call at the university agency. They're not passive um, watchers. They are people that make each performance anew uh, according to their own criteria. And you'll decide what's best for yourself. My own view is that we are lucky to be able to watch Swan Lake in the Pittsburgh performance with new eyes through a new lens. We would not want February 24th, the date of the invasion to have taken place. But at the same time, we can be the first historical generation of spectators that looks at this production and thinks, ah, now what does this mean? Now what sense do we make of this? Uh, the ballet has no cooperation with the Russian government. And I would prefer to think of it as an opportunity rather than something that triggers moral outrage. If we have moral outrage, I'd love it to be spent with donations to Ukraine, with fundraising, with uh, money given to Razum or Ukrainian refugee uh, donations, Red Cross and so forth, and not directed at something that is relatively um, a fragile, uh, but offers us an opportunity to look at this exquisite and vulnerable but active, historically active artifact, precisely at the historical moment when it takes on new meaning after the 24th of February. Um, what better gift can we give to ourselves than new thought? Uh, and how can we integrate this spectacle into the new reality uh, that we're living with uh, now? I only have a couple of minutes left. So I wanna um, say one other thing that circles back to the issue of Cold War diplomacy that Natalie had mentioned. Um, of course, Swan Lake takes on a kind of exaggerated meaning for a number of reasons. One of them is because Swan Lake participates in what could be called a kind of placeholder in uh, it, certainly in Soviet culture. Uh, and it has um, reverberations even to this day that Swan Lake stands in for the governmental leader. So within any sphere of culture, sphere of culture, there is, there is um, a, a place of primacy. In literature, for example, it could be Pushkin. In music, it's traditionally Glinka. In painting, it's traditionally Repin, who, by the way, is Ukrainian, you see. And so you see that what's going on today is a kind of custody battle. To whom does Repin belong? And if Repin is in fact Ukrainian, as he indeed historically is, then what sense do we make of the Ukrainian painter Repin? What sense do we make of the filmmaker Davshenko if we conceive him as a Ukrainian filmmaker and not as a, as a Soviet filmmaker or as a quote unquote Russian filmmaker? And these are urgent questions because Russian in the past, historically, the word Russian has meant anything within the Russian empire. So Pushkin would refer to the Caucasus, refer to modern day Georgia or Armenia as Russia because it was part of the Russian empire. Today, we're battling that out. We're stretching apart and breaking those associations in new ways that have never been broken before. So it's a very exciting time to be watching Swan Lake. Um, and uh, I think particularly an exciting time because you're the first audience to do so. It's a little like watching Hamlet right after the fall of the British Empire. I don't say that, I don't wanna minimize the kinds of horrors that we are seeing um, on television hour by hour and the battles, but I want to save a place that might far too easily be given to moral outrage for, for staging such a ballet and ask you instead to think about 
more actively to be an interlocutor with this production and to think about what new questions it poses for you and how you think about Russia differently and how you think about the construction of empire differently as you watch this production. I think I've raised enough questions that are potentially polemical that I'll probably stop here. I hope that there are responses to this. I welcome your point of view, either to what Natalie has uh, brilliantly given us as, as material historical background or to some of the views that I, I raised here. You'll know your, your point of view best, but I welcome your views. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pondy. We do have one comment um, from Chris. It says, I'm absolutely captivated by the concept of Swan Lake as a potent communication tool in Ethiopian language. I don't have a question, but if there's time, I'd love to hear additional examples of cryptic language to avoid censorship. Um, I can step, I can, if, if you'd like me to answer that right away. Sure. Ethiopian language is a great, great topic. Whoops, there's a, there's a whole book written about it by uh, a scholar called Losif. Um, my favorite example is in, during the late Soviet period, I was living in Moscow at the time and we were meant to be celebrating the 80th birthday or 86th birthday, whatever of Brezhnev. I won't get the details right. The point is a Sapian language, not which birthday it is. And there was a, uh, Leningrad journal, known to be somewhat anti-critical uh, uh, of the regime, although what critical meant at that time was very narrow. And um, on the 86th page of its journal, it published a short story about a decrepit old man dying, unloved old man dying in misery and shame. And it was put on page 86. Now, who is to say, you know, who is to say? Um, but there is example after example after example of that in Soviet culture in which things just happen to, to take place in a particular way that can be decoded in the same way that 2018, 1991 can be decoded. Um, so it's a rich topic. Uh, and if you Google Aesopian language, you'll find all kinds of good examples. Thank you, Nancy. Um, one more question um, about Tchaikovsky. Have recently heard that Tchaikovsky might be Ukrainian. Is that accurate? My guess is that there are people here in the audience who know that better than I, or perhaps <laughs> Natalie does, in which case she should feel free to interrupt me. Nat Natalie, would you like to interrupt me or shall I just carry no, on? Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, this may upset some, some of my interlocutors, but I think it's a very fraught question. I speak as somebody who has been married for 35 years to somebody who is either Ukrainian or Russian, depending on what the context is and depending on what's being asked of him. Um, this doesn't mean that they're a single nation. What it means is that the, the question is complex. And I, I privately think that we should resist necessarily as non-Ukrainians and non-Russians participating in their custody battle, because the bigger stakes are a model of culture that is a civilizational model in which the world, the people of the world are divided up. You have to go here, you have to go there. Uh, you know, the uh, Muslims belong here, the Jews belong there. And you can see down that path lies peril. I, I think to have a civilizational model of culture to begin with, which was very appealing to us because it replaced the ideological model of the Cold War. You see, that's why we embraced it so readily because it worked. It's a kind of lazy man's solution to everything. Um, but I, I think I would be skeptical of anything that wants us to put people in, in, um, in civilizational slots. I mean, I myself said Repin is, um, is Ukrainian because I looked at his biography when I was working on the preparation for this. But I think that the, 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 the loftier answer is that way lies confusion. Uh, it's certainly it's not for us to decide, you know. Thank you, Nancy. Um, a quick question for Natalie. Um, if you could talk a little more about um, the character dances that we see in so many of those classical ballets from the 19th century or the nationality dances as they're sometimes called and the relationship with Russian colonialism or imperialism. Just a little more about that because they do appear in multiple ballets of that era. Okay. 
So probably one of the most famous examples in the history of Russian ballet would be um, Arthur San Leon's Little Humpback Horse, which is also a, a very popular Soviet ballet and was also recently reconstructed by Alexei Rutmansky. So this, um, this was part of an intentional um, campaign to bring Russian themes and Russian folklore and Russian dance to the stage. So in the middle of the 19th century, one of the critiques by writers and intellectuals was um, that, you know, ballet in Russia was an aristocratic bauble. It was French and Italian. It didn't reflect the contemporary concerns of uh, the Russian people. And so, um, so, but what was ironic about this was that, of course, the little humpback horse was choreographed by a French choreographer. Um, and, and, you know, the critique um, in journals of the period essentially, um, you know, found it a travesty, as Nancy has talked about. Um, so I think, you know, from the very beginning, this attempt in Russia to, to create these character dances always has a sense of the framing that I referenced. Um, it's sort of part of a frame, um, and they're, they're presented as these these divertissements, these little pictures or, or tableau of nationality, but in fact, um, they're pretty pretty early on, sort of devoid of a, a connection. Although the choreographers themselves did go and you know study, uh, you know go to Vienna, go to uh, Poland, you know there there was um, an interest in actually studying these sorts of folk dance. But again, the question of authenticity is one that's very thorny. Um, and I mentioned about uh, Giselle, and so the romantic choreographer Jules Perrault. So during the Romantic era in in Paris, um, they were also very interested in folk dance, and it and it was um, integrated in a very different way in the choreography. They they weren't de Verdesmont. You could see um, sort of folk textures or styling um, in the in the choreography it, itself as it developed the plot. And so I think you really see that shift when when we come to Russia um, and have the sort of late great 19th century ballets. Thank you. Um, and one other question for you, Natalie, just um, if you could comment a little more your, your comment at the end of the ballet when uh, Siegfried, um, when Odette dies and Siegfried survives, um, mm -hmm. your comment about it as an apotheosis of European culture. If you could talk a little more about that. And, and also there are different endings to the ballet that that um, people so experience. One of, so one of, um, thank you. One of the things I've, I've really been thinking about, so um, recently I also participated in a symposium um, with the National Ballet of Canada and the National Dance Institute on, on racialization in ballet. And it actually made me uh, reconsider a lot of the aspects of ballet that I had seen as quote unquote universal. And one of them was, was this ballet blanc tradition. Um, and so the tradition of ballet blanc, like I said, it goes back to the sort of Paris opera and uh, these, and part of the reason that ballet blanc developed was actually to showcase the new gas lighting in the theater and the beautiful tool costumes that were rendered transparent by the gas lighting. So there was um, sort of a production design driving it and of course there was an interest in in um, having these sort of supernatural creatures that were very fascinating um, and they it was also connected with um, sort of anxiety about the role of women um, in in France at that time and this idea of these sort of organized groups of women who exerted this power um, this sort of femme fatale power um, so so I think all of these go into the the ballet blanc um, but then at the same time, um, when you look back now, um, it does seem that um, with, you know, contemporary discussions of representation in ballet, you see that this sort of whitewashing of, uh, you know, make rendering ballet's abstraction about whiteness is, is problematic. And um, it's something that, you know, needs to be reconsidered in terms of, um, you know, how to present Swan Lake moving forward. Um, I know we have, of course, the use of all the flesh tone tights and point shoes now. Um, and so, but you still have, um, I think in, in Swan Lake, it's very marked. Um, so you have the emergence of, you know, the Odette Odeal um, contrast or polarization. But then also in 1895, that's when you have the emergence of black swans in the core as well. Um, but they're not as prominently displayed as these sort of henchmen of von Rothbart as they are in the Sergeyev production from 1950. And so that's um, that's something that I think um, 
is just worth unpacking and considering as as people progress forward. And as I said, I worked you know with the Washington Ballet and their production. And um, actually, the role that um, the Black Swans play, or some of the choreography from the Stepanov notation, um, Julie Kent and Victor Barbie um, used part of that as an inspiration for instead of having Black Swans, they had gray signets and um, performed by the younger uh, professional school dancers. And so um, there was, there was you know, a, a way of kind of looking at this new generation having this sort of gray, the gray swans emerging um, rather than just having the stark black and white. Fascinating. Um, another comment, um, it's a little bit long, but I'll, I'll go through it. Um, Tchaikovsky, uh, had an estate in Ukraine that was recently ruined by Russian troops, just as an aside there. Uh, in the comment, I noticed that since the Russian aggression started in February, Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra published several upcoming performances featuring Russian composers, and I'm looking forward to Swan Lake's perspective. At the same time, I hear from my friends in Russia and Europe that Russian culture is being canceled everywhere. Tchaikovsky is crossed out, et cetera. Have you seen examples of canceling Russian culture in the US and do we anticipate Russophobia penetrating the cultural field, cultural? Nancy, do you wanna take that on? Sure, I'll start. Um, I'll say something that is somewhat provocative um, as a starting point, And that is, I actually believe that Russophobia as such really does exist. It may exist for good reason or bad reason, but I think it really does exist. It has a long history in the United States. Books and articles have been written about it. It's an interesting topic, number one. Um, number two, I think that we're at this difficult moment when we have to examine our own conscience at every step about whether we're engaging in historical, traditional US russophobia which includes uh, our attitudes towards communism for which there was much to object, um, or whether we're doing something else. I myself am comfortable with canceling anything that is supported by the Russian government for as long as it takes to reach a new historical stage, however we define that institutionally. I'm not uncomfortable with Anna Nitrebka not being able to sing. It gives ample opportunity for new Ukrainian singers to sing or other people to sing. I, I don't find this as a, a, a stage in order to perform my moral outrage. I think it's, an, it's a, a, a sensible, organic part of a vibrant uh, culture here in the US that we have those arguments. And I, I, I can't even say that my own thinking has reached a, a point of stability as example af, 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 after example comes up, well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? The only other thing I'll say on this topic is not to take a, um, a rigid position because my thinking is in flux, but to mention that very similar debates have gone on in the past not only with British imperialism, but more poignantly, more acutely with productions of Wagner, uh, Meister Singer, which has anti-Semitic passages in it. The pedantic critic, for example, is taken traditionally as a, a anti-Semitic figure or the Nibelungen in the uh, ring cycle for Wagner. And all of that has to be processed through and has been processed through by incredibly talented um, conductors such as Baron, Baron Boehm, or uh, producers such as Barry Kosky at Commerce Oper Berlin, who have embraced these issues and tried to open up a space for debate and disagreement and new thinking. Um, so my own view is not so much what is right or wrong, because the queue is very long of people that are better at that than me at deciding what is right and wrong. But rather my investment is the sensation of um, how we can think new thoughts, how can we think differently, how can we square that with our conscience on a minute by minute basis as we turn on the television, I'm of the generation that still turns on the television, watches the news each night, turns on the television, sees that it's gotten still worse and looking for hope. Um, so there, there's plenty of right or wrong to be decided upon. I think with cultural performance, if we can make that distinction, 
it's it's very it's a very very complicated issue, and I I hesitate to rush in with my verdict, because for fifty five years I have lived and traveled and studied off and on in the Soviet Union and Russia. And I've seen the legacy of deciding that this is absolutely right and this is absolutely wrong and it should be carved in stone. That Soviet legacy did enormous damage. And I, I don't rush to take up the authority of being a, 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 someone who gives that kind of verdict. Thank you, Dr. Condi. And Olivia, I believe that you were interested in uh, maybe commenting on that. <laughs> Hi, Lisa, thanks. Uh, yeah, so we just wanted to say thank you so much to the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater for making this program poss possible and inviting us to partner with you. Uh, and if you enjoyed today's program, please follow us at the Council on Social Media and visit our website at worldpittsburgh.org to learn more about upcoming council programs, including our upcoming Spring Soiree on June 9th, where we are celebrating culture and community with global music performances and food. Hey, thank you, Olivia, and um, thanks to the World Affairs Council and um, also to All for All Pittsburgh for supporting us in this program as well. I want to also thank Dr. Rulen and Dr. Condi so much for joining us today, sharing their expertise and shining a different kind of light on this beautiful ballet, giving us kind of a deeper understanding of how to consider this piece of art in today's world. Lisa, can I say one, one 10 second thing addition? Um, next week begins a, um, a three day uh, Ukrainian film symposium. If you Google uh, Pitt and Ukrainian cinema, you'll see that we're screening some of the Ukrainian cinema that hasn't been seen uh, some of it ever in the United States. And it's free, it's with subtitles. You're welcome to come and watch and participate in the discussion. We've got the top two curators from Dovzhenka Center um, participating, giving introductions. So you're welcome to come to that if uh, if you are interested in seeing what Ukrainian cinema uh, looks like on the big screen. Thank you, sorry to butt in. Oh no, thank you, Nancy, <laughs> thanks so much. And just to say again, please join us next week for our uh, second program in this series, Cultural Exchange and Global Conflicts, Swan Lake and Beyond. And our speakers for that program are journalist Mila Sanina, Dr. Adriana Helbig, uh, Chair of the Music Department at University of Pittsburgh, and Vamp Alloy co-founder Elsa Limbach. And thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate you being here and we will hope to see you next week. Thanks so much. <laughs>